Yeah, well, there are several things to worry about over here, and there's an excessive focus right now on what does it mean for us. I think a better place to start, perhaps, is what does it really mean for the Chinese? Right, right now, the Chinese government, by allowing the yuan to devalue overnight, uh, which, by the way, is not currency manipulation, despite what's being alleged on Trump, uh, by Trump on Twitter, <laughs> um, there are lots of risks for the Chinese side. Um, when it comes to the uh, yuan devaluation, the first and the most important one, I think, is this risk of capital flight. Right? We saw that in 2015 when there was a devaluation, we saw the risk of capital flight really take off. Uh, you're going to have Chinese investors and, and wealthy Chinese who will want their money in other, in other places. So that's a big risk there. Um, the other thing, the other part I want to talk about, of course, is um, the weakness for uh, what that means for the Chinese consumers, right? right. So when the what yuan depreciate, depreciates, well, your exports become cheaper, so that's the US side, which we can come to, but then your imports become more expensive. So now what you're doing is you're really cutting down on the purchasing power of your consumer. If you're an economy that wants to move from being the factory of the world, this investment-heavy, industry-heavy, export-dependent um, economy, to an economy that wants to run on its domestic consumption, well, then attacking your consumers in that way is, is obviously a very dangerous move. Shazad, why is it not currency manipulation? I think that's a really important point. Yeah, because right now you're not seeing the bank, the PBOC step in and peg the dollar to, say, a 7.2 or 7.5, right? The, the yuan is allowed to trade in a narrow band, and that's what you've seen happen, where the bank has essentially let it slide. But you haven't seen the yuan being pegged to um, a, a higher uh, uh, you know, uh, yuan. So, so we are in the midst of, of a trade war right now. I think it's Correct. it's fair to say. What what ammunition does each country have left in this trade war? Uh, well, from the U.S. side, essentially, we can let the tariffs go into effect on September first. Uh, that will mean that all U.S. Um, imports, um, you know, from China are going to be under tariffs. That's obviously the biggest so one. Ten percent. Um, some at twenty-five. That's correct. Exactly. Now, beyond that, from the U.S. perspective, the U.S. can obviously start going after the Chinese tech uh, businesses. Huawei is the one we all talk about. It's on the entity list, which means that currently its ability to do business domestically is limited. Um, it can go on another list whereby it would actually be, be illegal for U.S. firms to start selling parts uh, to Huawei, right? Then you can talk about other various other Chinese tech companies that might come under assault as well. From the Chinese side, I do feel like options are somewhat limited, right? So there is no tit-for-tat tariffs. That's just not it's, it's impossible because the Chinese don't import as much from the U.S. Ag purchases, everybody's talking about them. It's also important to consider that crop purchases have declined quite precipitously over the last couple of years, right? So there's, again, limited maneuvering there. I think the real place where the Chinese side can hit the, uh, the U.S. is <clears throat> by going after Chinese uh, by going after American businesses mm -hmm. in China, right? Tighter regulations, more scrutiny, more checks, um, delaying licensing, et cetera. So making life difficult for American businesses in China is probably one of the more, um, uh, the stronger tactics that the Chinese government can employ. If we can reference the tweet again that President Trump posted earlier today, uh, specifically mentioning the Fed. Are you listening, Federal Reserve? From the Fed side of things, if you're Fed Chair Jerome Powell, and you're watching this get tweeted yeah. on the day versus Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin, who has the larger action on their plate or inaction uh, that is going to be a bigger play in this mm -hmm, broader mm -hmm. um, currency spat that is going to be right. in place? So, you know, one of the things we were saying uh, publicly last week uh, was that had President Trump gotten the cut that he was looking for, perhaps none of this would have happened in the first place, right? So he, what he really wanted was to, for, the, for the Fed to go back and give him a 50 basis point cut. Um, that never happened. That, to a large extent, angered the president. Um, he's making sure that the Fed is listening because, quite frankly, what he wants are, are, is, is more aggressive intervention from the Fed, more cuts. Markets are not starting to price that in, right? People, expectation of four cuts over the next 12 to 18 months, something like that. Um, so the idea really is that, look, we need, we need to juice growth further because we're heading into the election year, and that's kind of what's so, central so, of it. Shazad, explain exactly what is causing today's massive sell-off. Because the, the tariffs that were threatened by the Trump administration were announced yeah. last Thursday afternoon. They caught a lot of people off guard. Yeah. Uh, and then it was overnight that Bloomberg reported uh, that China had instructed state-owned firms to stop buying agricultural products right. in the U.S. Yeah. Uh, what connection does that have to the Dow, the S&P 500, uh -huh. uh, and the Nasdaq? Yeah, so the sell-off that began last night in Asian markets, saw it in Europe and now here in the U.S. this morning, it's connected all to a singular sentiment, which is that perhaps there is no end in sight. That this trade war 
which maybe back in April or May, it looks like there could be a deal perhaps by the end of the year even, that now we're not going to see a deal, that this is going to not only drag out, there's nothing happening, by the way, in September and October. We're heading into the PRC 70th anniversary. Uh, the Chinese side is not going to be doing anything serious on the trade side at all, which means later in the year, could something have been done? Potentially, but now I think we're looking at this dragging on. It is very likely that so, this drags on through the election, and that's a lot of uncertainty. Um, yeah. So what investors are saying today is that stocks were, were had previously been priced in for some sort of deal. Correct. They're less confident about that deal. That's They're exactly now right. Pricing stocks for an ongoing trade war with no end in sight. That's right. That's exactly right. And the heightened risk, perhaps, that if global growth does slow down, well, then that's you know, and, and there's any kind of a recession. So all those fears are bubbling up, and that's exactly what we're seeing behind us around us today. For economists that are tracking very closely a global economic slowdown and where the, what this means for the U.S. and the companies here as well, you know, when we think about that, what is the more likely leading factor to a global slowdown? Would it be trade policy or would it be Fed policy mm -hmm. and how the two intermingle together as well? Yeah, so I, you know, I think one of the things to keep in mind is that European economies had been slow, have been slowing for a while, actually, sure. which is why you're seeing much more aggressive action uh, there as well with the ECB and all the rest. On the Chinese side, on the Asian side, again, you're seeing economic slowdown. The Japanese numbers that came out last week uh, showed that, again, the economy remains quite slow. So what you have is a you know, genuine slowdown within these economies as it is. The goal of the Fed now, of course, would be to prevent that from happening within the U.S. and to intervene in a way, I mean, I think far more aggressively than was understood even last week, um, uh, you know, to, to ensure that growth continues apace. For a trade war with no end in sight, you know, how could the American consumer, how could fund managers, how could investors, how can consumers ultimately, how should they be thinking about mm -hmm. when this might come to a solution if it's not during this presidency, right. then the next, thereafter, how long would a trade deal uh, potentially take to right. get on the table, signed, sealed, delivered, sure. so that we could start to rebuild. Yeah, and I mean, that's that's a big question, right? Because there's no telling that if, let's say, in the next election cycle, you have a Democrat get elected, somebody like a Bernie Sanders or an Elizabeth Warren, both of them belong in the protectionist trade camp as well, right? So this idea that perhaps the Chinese can get a better deal with a Democrat, that's not necessarily true. Um, as far as consumers are concerned, I think consumers really will not feel the pain of this if we are able to substitute the products, right? So if there are other countries that we're able to get the products from. Mm. Now, of course, if you're talking about an American trade war against multiple countries at the same time getting ratcheted up, tariffs getting ratcheted India, up. India, for example. India, for example, you know, various other European countries, then the consumers start to feel the pain. So it is quite likely that this continues for a while. And consumers, as much as we fear today, will be hurting. Maybe come Christmas, they're not really feeling the pain.